The global war on terror began 20 years ago after two hijacked planes hit the World Trade Center towers and a third plane crashed into the Pentagon. The 9-11 terror attacks launched by extremist group Al-Qaeda claimed 3,000 lives and triggered the US invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, which were breeding grounds for terrorists. After two decades of counter-terrorism and attempts at nation-building, the US withdrew from Afghanistan last month, pledging to end forever wars. And while the war may be over, it's by no means an ending. The costs and the impact of the war still go on in human lives and dollars. We discuss how, what the true cost of war is on terror, and for this we are joined today by Clifford Borman, retired Chief Warrant Officer of the US Army National Guard, and Catherine Lutz, uh, co-director of the Costs of War Project at Brown University, and Professor Emerita of Anthropology and International Studies at Brown University. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And well, Mr. Borman, now this terrible tragedy that happened 20 years mm. ago, on the day you were there at the Pentagon, you were desperately searching for survivors where the American Airlines Flight 77 had crashed. And it was a site of abject destruction, but you were still searching painstakingly for 18 hours. Could you tell mm. us in your words what happened on September 11th from your perspective? You know, um, I was in I was in route to the Pentagon when the plane hit uh, that morning. Uh, you know, it was just kind of a mass confusion there when the attack occurred. Uh, and you know, you you're in the military, so your training takes over, and you just try to go and help as many people as you can. That's that's possible. Um, I was lucky enough that I was working with a gentleman, and we were using a spectrum analyzer to pick up cell phone frequencies, and we would continue the search, you know, uh, at all areas of the Pentagon looking for victims of the attack. And I, that continued um, throughout the day and into the night, and I stayed on site until early morning the 13th uh, when I finally went home. Uh, and then it was at that time that I contacted my family. Up until that time, they, they had no idea if I was alive or if I had passed away. Uh, well, you did survive that day, but uh, a year and three months later, you uh, attempted um, suicide after mm -hmm. just going through that terrible trauma. And while well, the Brown University's uh, Cost of War project, it shows that, well, it estimates that over 30,000 active duty personnel or veterans died by suicide, as compared with the over 7,000 killed in post 9 11 war operations. Mr. Borman, does this surprise you that you know, servicemen are driven to this point of making that difficult decision? I mean, what would you say was the trigger point for you in December 2002? Um. For me, it was a it was a it was a year long process. So on a one year anniversary of 9/11, one of the newspapers had ran an article, um, and unfortunately, one of the boys were riding into his mom and had crawled over half her body at the Pentagon, and that kind of really started my downward spiral uh, with having nightmares and dreams uh, with what I saw and what I did uh, that day, and then instead of talking to a counselor or, or seeking help, I started drinking more to deal with those thoughts and dreams that I was having. And we know with post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, that's one of the causes or one of the symptoms of it. And so it was that process during the year. I was just feeling stressed from being, you know, at work, stressed from my family trying to help me, but I didn't understand what was going on with me to, to tell them how to help me or, or what to do. Um, I was home for Christmas uh, on December 20th. Uh, I was alone at my brother's house there in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, he's a nurse. He works at Truman Medical Center there in Kansas City, about a mile from his house. And I just overwhelmed with the sense of guilt and not wanting to live with the guilt and not find anybody alive on that day. Everybody I, I found on the, the Pentagon had, was deceased. And I just didn't want to deal with the stress of life no more. And I took 20 plus sleeping pills, wrote a note and laid down on the couch. My brother got a funny feeling at work and he called called his house and I didn't answer the phone. And when I didn't answer the phone, he rushed home and ultimately he saved my life. And well, when you woke up in the hospital though, you, uh, you found that taking your life wasn't the solution. And then after that, you set out on yeah. this path of amazing recovery. And well, how was this process for you? So we know that when you have post-traumatic syndrome, you have to learn how to deal with your triggers. You know, it's been a long process for me. The biggest thing for me is that when I came out of the hospital, went back on duty and back in Virginia, is I was honest with my counselor uh, when I went and go talk with him about 
things that I felt and why I was feeling that way. And that seemed to help a big weight lifted off my chest. And that really started my road to recovery uh, once once I was open and honest with your counselor and your therapist. And that's one thing when I go out and do my speaking events is I tell people all the time that if you're not honest with your counselor and really tell them what's the root of your problem, they can't really effectively treat you. Uh, so I find that's very important. And well, the tragedies of the uh, beginning of the war on terror and, well, it's, uh, the, its impact still goes on today. And Professor Lutz now, mm -hmm. Well, Pre uh, President Biden decided to pull out U.S. troops from Afghanistan uh, fully last month. But would you say that the war on terror is well and truly over? Or is it still ongoing? As your project has pointed out, conflicts do continue in surrounding countries. Well, as uh, your first guest has just uh, so eloquently described, uh, the wars don't end for uh, that, that day has not ended uh, for so many people. Uh, all of the people who did the work of rescue on that day um, 20 years ago and all the people who have dealt with the violence that ensued in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan and other places. So, no, our project has found that uh, the war continues in 85 countries. If you include all of the places where the United States is fighting counterterrorism through either uh, combat itself or um, training of local uh, troops and police in counterterrorism, or uh, again, providing arms and, and other kinds of proxy uh, fighting capacity. So there's really a very strong, ongoing and very expensive war that continues. And Professor Lutz, what did the war on terror achieve though over the last 20 years? And would the numbers indicate that the outcome of it justifies the costs? Okay, well, really, it's very hard to to say that uh, any death is worth uh, a political goal, uh, but uh, just to most basically look at what the cost has been, our project has found uh, an $8 trillion price tag, but more importantly, a, um, the death of 930,000 people at minimum as a result of the wars that ensued. Um, and this is the deaths due to violence on all sides uh, and in these uh, various war zones. So one can't say, I think, that 930 deaths, 930,000 deaths are, are worth the goal of, again, trying to achieve uh, certain goals that we'll, we'll talk about. But um, I think that's really, the answer has to be no, it has not achieved the goal of keeping the world safe from violence. Well, and there's no clear cut ending to it, really. And the US may have left Afghanistan, but that doesn't settle the $2.3 trillion bill that you mentioned in your project. Um, your project said that the uh, societal costs will continue to arise from Afghanistan and the Iraq wars, um, even after US troops have long gone. What are going to be the societal costs that will continue to incur? Well, as Ms. Rauman has just pointed out, uh, for those who go through these kinds of horrific events, 9-11 uh, on forward, um, there's a lifetime often of post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a lifetime of grief if you've lost family members. Uh, there's a lifetime of struggle to retain, re, recover your economic life that you had before uh, the war disrupted it. Um, again, and this is true, especially in the war zones of Iraq and Afghanistan, where so much of people's livelihood and so much of the economy was disrupted, has been disrupted by the war. And Professor Lutz, you also mentioned the social and environmental costs of war as well that, um, that have that now remain in those countries. Uh, how should these costs then be settled? Well, we know that some of these costs are incalculable. You can't put a number on them exactly. But just to take, for example, the environmental impact, um, we know that the war uh, uses a tremendous amount of fossil fuel. So the contribution of Pentagon fossil fuel use uh, for these wars on uh, global warming is not insubstantial. Um, it rivals the, the Pentagon's fossil fuel use, rivals the fossil fuel use of uh, many smaller modern industrial countries. Um, the civil liberties costs, the human rights costs, uh, we, re we must remember back to Abu Ghraib and other uh, places, not just in at the United States' uh, uh, initiative, but other countries' initiatives who had uh, allied themselves with the United States in this war. Um, they have often, again, cut corners on the basic human liberties, 
um, human rights that we have come to take for granted uh, since World War II. So there's been an erosion in, in many aspects of our um, of the, the, the kinds of, of political life that we want to have uh, internationally. Well, really, the impact of war really doesn't just uh, stop with evacuation, but, uh, well, it, we're reminded of it every year as well on September 11th. And, Mr. Bowman, it must be unimaginably really hard for you on September 11th every year. I mean, how do you deal mm -hmm. with the days, I mean, the difficulty of it and the emotions, but yet still find the strength to help and motivate other soldiers? Well, you know, for me, it's, you know, I don't watch TV on 9-11. I was there. I don't need to to see it. We played over and over again. It, it plays in my head daily. Um, you know, so I usually just spend my time with my family and my kids. I have a 7-year-old and a 17-year-old. So, you know, that really is what I do is just reflect on my family and, you know, all those things I wouldn't have had I been successful that day. Um, you know, not only was I at the Pentagon on 9-11, I also deployed in support of our Operation Iraqi Freedom. So, um, you know, the cost of war and, and the cost of going to war is, is, is something that, that we as soldiers accept when we, you know, when we join the military. Um, but, you know, we just need to take care of our veterans and make sure that they can go and get the help that they need uh, when they need it. And, you know, it's just really great to see the strides that the military has made in the last 20 years or since my suicide attempt and really helping soldiers be able to go out and get that help they need, uh, you know, when they can or when they least ask for it. Mr. Owen, at what point should you seek help or consultation for PTSD and how can family, friends or people close to you um, recognize those symptoms? You know, it, it's kind of tricky, but if you notice, you know, all of a sudden that they're, they're avoiding certain things that they used to do before, uh, if they're talking about the dreams maybe for a little bit, then they stop talking about the dreams. Maybe negative changes in their mood, um, you know, make negative thoughts about their self. Uh, you know, like, you know, I don't feel like myself anymore or, you know, I don't feel like doing anything. Uh, you know, lack of interest in doing stuff that they used to enjoy before. Uh, changes in their physical, emotional uh, self. You know, most days I'm a happy-go-lucky guy and some days I'm not. And, you know, so you just always want to just to see if, if they're kind of extra on guard, if they're easily startled by things. You know, I know Fourth of July sometimes can be a trigger for me if I'm not expecting a loud boom or something. Uh, and so you just need to be kind of watchful and, and just kind of pay attention. You know, I, t I tell people all the time, if, if you have that friend or family member and, and they're just kind of went quiet and they're not talking, pick up the phone or text them or go by the house and see them and just, just see if they're okay. Uh, I tell people all the time, you know, it's, it's okay not to be okay. We all can't have good days and we have bad days sometimes. And just going that extra step to be helpful really sometimes just is all really a person needs sometimes. But if you really notice a lot of changes in somebody, um, I would say that if you ask my family up until my attempt, there was probably signs there they missed, but there were probably signs there that they saw that they just didn't realize. And well, Professor Lutz, now President Joe Biden, he made it clear that America is going to continue to fight terrorism and that the withdrawal from Afghanistan marks a new chapter um, for its war on terrorism. But of course, there are different views over the approach. But what mistakes do you think should be avoided and how do you think terrorism should be fought going forward? Well, I think that it's really important to recognize that uh, there are more uh, armed militants today than there were 20 years ago uh, as a result of the disruptions, um, the destabilization of the, the wars of the last 20 years. And so I can't, I can't say that the current approach, even uh, to, to fight it at a distance, it has been effective. Um, and I do think that we need to think about war in new ways and to think about the Pentagon not as the first uh, solution, the first tool that you go to to solve the problem of of uh, people who would use terror tactics against civilians, but to say, you know, how do we lessen that through uh, policing, through the kinds of, and, and again, some of this has been effective, uh, the kinds of um, insights that have been gotten through, uh, again, uh, techniques that don't involve invasions and occupations of countries. But drone strikes, uh, airstrikes uh, kill civilians, um, even when there is an attempt to avoid it. Uh, there are many ways in which this war at a distance is still going to not only be extremely expensive, but continue to kill um, innocent civilians in ways that could be avoided through other techniques. 
Um, Mr. Borman, now terrorist groups, they launch violent attacks, not simply to kill, but to instill fear and psychological distress. Mm. And, well, in your opinion, how should the war on terror be fought by Americans? And what support needs to be given to the servicemen who need to deal with this conflict and tragedy from the uh, front lines? You know, I, I think just like um, the doctor was talking about, it's got to be a multi-head approach. I think how we look at terrorism and how they, they do attacks and how they attack, we've learned a lot in the last 20 years, and I think we need to take that knowledge and move forward. Um, you know, as far as, as veterans and, and people like myself going out and, and getting help, um, I, that has improved. I think, you know, with the wars and with PTSD and how we treat PTSD has really improved over the last 20 years, and I think it will continue to improve. You know, the biggest issue we got being soldiers is asking for help. And something so easy is so hard to do. And, you know, I tell soldiers all the time and, and people that I speak to when I talk about my story of hope is I understand it. I was there. I get it. Um, you know, I know what it's like to go from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain. Um, but I always tell people all the time, just if you don't think you're important, you're important to somebody and they love you and they want you here tomorrow. So, you know, please pick up the phone and call somebody for help if you're in that type of situation. Well, unfortunately, due to time, this is where we'll have to wrap up the interview. But thank you very much for your time today. That was Clifford Borman, retired Chief Warrant Officer of the U.S. Army National Guard, and Dr. Catherine Lutz, Co-Director of the Costs of War and Professor Emerita of Anthropology and International Studies at Brown University. Again, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for listening.